Hello and welcome back to I Need Healing. We will be continuing where we left off, which if you recall is after the healer Apollo, who is a white tiger, um, and his party basically wiped out. Uh, in the original version of this uh, game, which would be the prologue, you either save the lion or you save the wolf, I believe. One of them one of the characters that you're with actually dies, I think. Um, I think his name was Jim. He ends up getting dragged away. Um, however, in this version, I believe both the lion and the wolf survive. And you're able to sustain a little bit of the healing circle, but you essentially just wipe out. Um... So yeah, we're either going to see what happens afterwards, or who knows? I don't know. I haven't read ahead. I don't know. Hmm? <laughs> Anyways, so um, without further ado, let us continue I Need Healing. You reach for the tavern door and push it open. You make your way in and... Apollo, my guy! As soon as you enter the tavern, the loud voice from behind the bar, Caden, the barkeep, can be seen waving her hands high in the air, pulling yours and most of the other people's attention. Hey, I'm back. You walk through the room and reach the counter. The large doe awaits for you, with arms at her waist. By then, everyone else has returned to their business. Always glad to see you in one piece. Hmm, thanks. You take off your bag from your shoulders and rest it on the counter, then take a heavy pouch tied to your waist and put it by the bag. Caden is quick to notice the pouch. Big payout, hmm? You could say something like that. Good for you, my man. She proceeds to turn away for a moment, taking a mug from the shelf and a bottle from under the counter. In a few seconds, she's pouring you a drink. It was actually pretty easy this time. She pushes the mug and it goes sliding over the counter, stopping precisely at your hand. We thought that there was going to be a dragon, but... A dragon? A father-flipping dragon? In the end, was just a big lizard. Poor thing went down so fast. Still, hot damn, dude. You pick up the mug and take a small sip. The sweet taste of the... Amanium beverage is always a nice treat. And speaking of hot dudes, you almost choke on the drink. Caden is wiggling her eyebrows. Got you a gig, if you wanna. Bella was looking for a healer, a good one. You put the mug down and wipe your muzzle with your arm. Well, I... I gotta sell these clusters first. You poke the pouch on the counter. Just meet the guy, will ya? He's a fun lad. Hmm... Okay, fine. She raises her posture and shouts. Mundo! Come get your healer! You turn your head to look where she's shouting at. You spot a well-built German shepherd getting up from a chair and walking your direction. He's sporting a messy yet charming hair, and his fur looks poorly kept. Nevertheless, you can immediately relate to Caden's thoughts. He walks with confidence as soon as he notices you. A sly smile forms on his face. Hey there. He stops by your side on the bar, eyeing you up and down discreetly. You notice the hint of alcohol coming from his breath, from just one sentence. Name's Sigmund, but you can call me... Mundo. The doe grabs the dog by the shoulders and shakes him playfully. Only you can call me that. He lets his neck go limp and his head shakes around comically, his smile never fading away. Caden finally releases him, letting Sigmund regain his form and clear his throat, trying to salvage his first impression. Sig, you can call me Sig. He shows you his sly smile once again and offers you a hand. You must be Apollo, right? You frown while reaching for his hand. His handshake is quite firm. You know me? 
I've seen you around. Pretty hard to miss. That beautiful fur of yours is such an exquisite sight. He keeps a gentle hold of your hand. Ah. Uh, um. He chuckles. And she did scream your name when you got him. Oh, true. You're the best healer that I know, man. Mundo, you're not going to find a better pick. Well, ain't that a treat? You feel your cheeks warm up. You reach for the mug for another sip. How about I pay for your drink? He puts on the most charming smile so far and reaches his hand into his trousers pockets. Do we accept the flirtatious German Shepherd's, you know, proposition or... Hmm. Nah, I can pay my own way. Uh... Fine. You quickly realize that his gesture of putting the hand on his pocket made it seem like you were staring at his junk. You gag and choke on the liquid. You put the mug on the counter, coughing and wiping your face with a hand. Sigmund seems delighted by your reaction. You aren't sure if he noticed you staring. Uh, <clears throat> I I'm sorry. He chuckles and takes a silver coin from the pocket before flipping it in the air. It lands on the counter. Flustered so easily? I might be paying for all your drinks then. You finish wiping your muzzle with an arm, but before that you can say anything, Caden slaps the coin and takes it. She gives you a smirk and a wink. You're such a gentleman, Mundo. Hmm, I try my best. The two exchange a smile. Then the dog is back to eyeing you. Hmm, I'll let you two gents talk business. She does a very exaggerated wink at him, and then slowly walks away, giggling. Sigmund seems amused by her aunt theatrics. When she's gone, he crosses his arms over the counter and focuses his attention back on you. So, you're an experienced healer, yeah? You shrug. I can heal, yeah. There is a dungeon that's been growing for a few weeks now, off the mountains on the south road. Not terribly big, but... No cakewalk either. A dungeon? In all of your time adventuring, you only set foot in a dungeon maybe a handful of times. Those are usually much more dangerous than the monster camps that commonly appear with Abyss Springs. It will take a few days until the Arbiters swoop in. I'm thinking... He looks around for a second. We could clear it before that. We got the muscles. He lifts his arm and flexes for you. You can't tell if he was expecting a reaction, as it just lasts a moment before he continues on. But it would be a lot safer with a healer on board, you know? Yeah, I get that. Arborea has become somewhat of a pillar for adventurers looking to group up and take on a quest to clear out and seal the Abyss Mana Springs. Healers and magic casters in general are very rare compared to the loads of skilled fighters that follow this path. This benefits you, making you a popular option for a lot of groups. So, what do you say? He leans in closer to you now. Would you like to join me? Something about his demeanor gives you a sense that he does indeed look capable of dealing with a dungeon. Or at least, he has much trust on himself that he can do it. Mm, sounds like a great offer. Can I think about it? Of course. Come nighttime. Maybe back here, yeah? I'll show you the rest of the raiding party. Okay then. Hmm. Nice. Enjoy your drink. And he winks to you. He turns to walk away and you can't help but to notice how his tail swings casually from side to side. You catch yourself staring and then turn to your drink, taking a big swig at it. Damn you, Caden. You walk around the streets of Arborea, a city that does justice to its name given the plentiful vegetation all around. Trees and bright green bushes grow around the roads and decorate the surroundings of every building. You spot Magic Finds, a rather fancy looking shop front that stands out from most of other shops.
You enter the place and the tiny bell rings as the door swings open and then closes. The unmistaken floor of fragrance makes you feel at ease. Max? You find the hyena standing behind the counter, talking to two customers who appear to be buying a set of jewelry. You decide to browse the shelves around the shop while waiting for him to finish his business. The place is neatly organized with all sorts of magical artifacts, robust books and potion flasks with different colors. You pull a few of the books, reading the cover briefly before putting them back on the shelf. One specific book draws your attention, The Green Guide, a study about stimulation magics. You start flipping through the pages, but soon after, you hear the customers saying their goodbyes. You put the book back on the shelf and walk to the front counter. Good business. Uh, oh, uh, Apollo. I, I didn't realize that it was you. He dusts off his clothes in a hurry and adjusts his glasses. Sorry, sorry. I look all messy. You look fine. He's blushing while pulling his collar. You, you're always too kind. And I hope you'll repay it in kind. You feel yourself smart while taking the pouch out of your waist and placing it on the counter. Got you a fat stack. Ah! He pulls the pouch closer and checks the insides. He takes one piece of an opaque, blue-tinted ore and examines it close. These are quite light. His tone shifts. Was obvious. Now he speaks as a proper scholar. And lacking in color, not very pure, I'm afraid. You cross your arms, to which he notices. I, I mean... And now he's back to being a flustered ball of fur. It's still valuable. There's a lot here. Yeah. The moment you start speaking, you feel bad for letting your disappointment show over something the hyena has zero control over. If anything, you should be thankful that he's not sugarcoating it. Uh, sorry. I thought that this was going to be a big one. It's... It's still quite a handful, Apollo. He takes a measuring mechanism from behind the counter. At least five gold coins, I'd wager. You raise an eyebrow. Okay. Yeah. Th that's good enough. He deposits the contents of the pouch on the balance, picking each ore one by one. Some of them are larger, but most are about the size of a coin. Hmm. He seems reluctant to say anything for a few seconds. Then he makes up his mind. Yeah, five gold coins. He's a bad liar, always spoiling you like this. Well, if you say so. He takes a smaller, much nicer looking pouch from under the counter and places the ten coins inside. Oh, wait. You dig into your bag and take out another leather pouch. Ash piece. Uh, found some on the road. You said that you needed more? Ah, perfect. You hand him the pouch and he takes one little gray bead from within. He pinches it between his fingers and squeezes it into a little pasty substance. I was going to ask you to find me some more eventually. You can have them. You lean over the counter, getting your face in closer with the hyenas. His face goes distinctively red. For five more coins. You hold your tongue out, giving him a devious smirk. Ah, uh, uh, Apollo. You pull away, giggling. Nah, I'm kidding. Keep them. You take the pouch with the gold coins and place it in your bag. But... You start walking away, stopping at the shelf where you found the book. Would you mind saving this one for me? You show him the copy of Green Guide. He readjusts his glasses to analyze the book on your hand. Ah, that's a new one. You bring it over to the counter. Out of my budget right now, so... I'll keep this copy for you. He smiles softly while you rest the book on his hands. Thanks, Max. You make your way to the front door, and as soon as you open it... And... Um... Uh, Apollo? You turn around to face him. He's blushing again. Yeah? I'm... I'm glad to see you safe. You feel your heart warming a little. Thanks, Max. I'll see you later.
She smiled to him before turning to leave the shop. Arguably the biggest and most well-known tavern in the outskirts of Arborea, the guild is a very well-lit building amongst the others in such a dark night. You make your way inside. The smell of ammonium, sweat, and piss are much stronger during this time of the day. The place is bustling with life. People of many sizes fill up the tables and the stools at the bar. Many of them are clearly drunk and speak on a volume much higher than they need to. Caden is kept busy serving beverages to all the customers she can. The rest of the staff seem to be equally busy. You stand by the entrance for only about half a minute before spotting the canine walking your direction. This time he looks distinctively more giddy. Apollo, ain't it? He approaches and is quick to lay an arm over your shoulders. You immediately wonder how many drinks he's had today. Did he spend the whole day here? It's me. So glad that you came. Over here. You're gonna love these guys, I promise. You eventually arrive at a table with assorted foods where a large black bear sits with a slim brown rat. The Ursuran holds a big mug in his hand, but doesn't look drunk at all. The rodent is laying back on her chair, holding a finger to her chin, looking at you with intrigue on her face. Apollo, this is my adventuring party. He points his open hand at the bear, who lifts his drink for you. Oberon, our ferocious barbarian. Contrary to what he just said, the bear gives you a very friendly smile. Hi. Hi. Our archery expert, the one and only Lady West. She scoffs playfully. Just West. Lady Just West. She and the bear seem to find that incredibly funny. And me, the legendary swordsman. He takes a step away from you and strikes a super exaggerated pose, flexing both arms. Oberon chuckles on the counter. West plants her head on her hand. Not the pose. Guys, say hello to our potential new party member. He snatches your shoulder back again, this time getting his face awfully close to yours. Apollo, the cute ass healer. Someone is a little too drunk for their own good, methinks. Mm. <laughs> you turn your head to the side, awfully aware that your embarrassment must be stamped all over your face. I, uh... You can hear Sigmund giggling to himself. Absolutely amused at how he's getting to you. Oh, yeah? <laughs> Apollo. You turn to look at the rodent with a smirk on her face. Blink twice if you're being held hostage. Oberon snorts his drink. He cleans his snout and then high-fives her. All right, yeah. That's the crew. Come sit down. He pulls a chair for you and then moves a mug over to your side of the table. You can finish mine. I'll get us another round. Oberon quickly chugs the remaining contents of his own mug and then slams it on the table. Don't mind if I do. And more wine for the lady. Lovely, but I'll pass. Good, that stuff is expensive. Sigmund laughs, giving you a pat on the shoulder and then walks away. You sit down and then take the half a thing mug the dog gave you. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Wes has a raised brow. You immediately grow extremely suspicious of the drink. You take it to your snout and take a sniff. The smell is almost overpowering. Oh, wow. Yep. What is this? It smells like amnium, but... It's called Rainy Day. It's just like amnium, but stronger. Yeah. You take the mug close... For another inspection. This is probably like a 10% concentration at least. A what? Err... Uh, you try to think of a quick and easy way to explain it. Uh, amnium is usually a 1% solution. This one is much more concentrated. Ah. 
The bear looks satisfied with your poor answer. Well, he's got some pretty good resistance to that stuff. He drinks this regularly? He does now. It's only been, like, a month. Oberon turns to you, curious. You drink that stuff too? You quickly put the mug down. Oh, no, no, no. I just know a thing or two about mixing and brewing. Wes leans in on her side of the table, her interest piqued. Oh, yeah? Please tell us more. Uh. Suddenly, you get an air of being interviewed for this healer spot. I do some alchemy from time to time. The shopkeeper from Magic Finds lets me use the equipment there. Whoa, that's cool. You make your own potions? Sometimes, yeah. A healer and an alchemist. She pokes a bear with her elbow. Seems like Sig struck gold with this one. Hmm. Hmm, yeah. You notice a bear staring at you with tired eyes. He doesn't look drunk, but maybe the amnium has started to get to him. So, how did you guys know each other? Well, me and Sig go way back. We've been getting ourselves into trouble ever since we were kids. The mud has a talent for it. She shrugs, theatrically. We've been on this questing business for a few years now. Had a small group back then, made some nice coin. Ah, nice. The guys were kind of jerks, though. One day we decided to do our own thing. She points her cup at the bear, who now shines bright with a proud smile on his face. That's when we came across this mountain. He pats his belly. Was everything that we needed to get this party going. You could say that I saved their asses a couple of times. She chuckles weakly and pushes him away, yet he maintains his proud pose. A moment later, Sigmund returns holding three mugs between his hands. He lands them on the table, spilling some liquid on the process. What are you guys talking about? He pulls a chair and sits close by your side. You can feel his tail swinging excitedly from side to side. Remember when we took Bear for our first mission together? Oberon quickly deflates. Oh, heavens. Ah, oh, yeah. He was scared shitless of those slimes. <laughs> They got it all on his clothes and... Uh, hey! Those things are tricky. Slimes, huh? They sure are. It was his first time fighting those. He was so scared. I just don't like slimes. What about that time with the harpies? Ah, yeah. Sigmund laughs out loud. Oberon lowers his head and covers his ears. Not the harpies. He was running from them like crazy. I couldn't even help. I was laughing so hard. The three share boasts and laughter, reminiscing about their adventures and stories together. One story leads into another and they banter about all the fun and cool things that they got themselves into. You can't understand most of what they are saying, but smile along given the friendly atmosphere. Man, I was glad that we got out of that one alive. Oh yeah. We got so lucky that time. Yeah. Their laughter finally seems to subside. We had some real good times together, eh? Sigmund raises his mug and Oberon is fast to dink it with his own, smiling. What about you? She turns to face you. Been adventuring for a while? Yeah, tell us about it. Pretty much. I've joined a few groups here and there, but most of them eventually... You hesitate. Mm, disband. Ah, unlucky. Sure is. But don't worry, my guy. We're in it for the long haul. Yeah, I can't leave these bozos. They'd be helpless without me. Sigmund bursts into laughter. Bah, don't listen to her. She casually starts sipping her drink, amused. <laughs> That's nice. And speaking of... Oberon pushes his empty mug to the center of the table. We should get going. Yeah... She finishes her drink and pushes her cup on the table as well. You guy doesn't need to see you two lose to the booze. Hey, I'm winning. Hmm. <laughs> Sigmund turns to you, speaking in a low tone now. 
So, what do you think? You're in? It doesn't take you long to make up your mind. You've joined groups much worse than this before. Yep, count me in. Hooray! The dog ha hazardly bumps your mugs together before turning to the rest of the group. He's in. We're doing the... Galago? Mines tomorrow. T tomorrow? Wait, the Galago Mines? Hold on, Sig. Everyone's attention quickly shifts to the rat. We're not going to that dungeon with the new guy that we just met. She looks at you with an understanding expression. No offense, dude. No, 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 no. I think you're right. You guys should trial me first. Oh, right. A trial? We could clear out a small camp. Honestly, great call. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's not... Looking at the others on the table, Sigmund seems to immediately realize that he will be fighting an uphill battle if he tries to disagree. I guess the dungeon can wait. Right. I mean... He looks at you now expectingly. I could use more potions. Better to be extra safe if we're gonna do that dungeon, right? He thinks about it for a couple of seconds, enough to make you wonder if he's achieved drunkenness levels too high to be able to make smart decisions. Okay, I get ya. He turns back to the group, apparently recovering his energy. Okay, so we gather up in the morning and take a camp from the board, yeah? Yeah. Sounds good. The sun has been showing its colors on the skies for less than an hour at this point. You show up to the tavern entrance where a few people stand in front of a big notice board with a crude drawing of the region's map. You can spot Sigmund and Wes standing close by the gathering of people. Morning. Oh hey, so glad to see you again. The canine has a more casual and relaxed air about him. Today, even his hair appears to be combed. Wes looks exactly the same. Hey there. Am I early? Nah, Bear's running late. Uh, give him a break. Probably drank too much. Look who's talking. You know that I'm tougher than I look. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. You look at the board. There's only a pair of big felines looking at it now. They stab one paper glue to the wood with a knife and leave it there before walking away. Did you guys pick up anything yet? We just got here, waiting for the crowd to disperse. Let's go check it out. You three approach the board. The map shows the city of Arborea and its surroundings. Scattered across the board are several papers stuck to it. Quest postings. The sentries put these up when they spot monster camps that have spawned. Adventurers leave their knives on the paper to signal that they have left for the camp. There are three unclaimed quest papers still on the board. We have options. We should wait for Bear to get here first. But do we have a preference? Hmm. She shrugs. This one... The other two turn their faces to look at the paper that you're pointing at. If we follow this trail, we can gather some Don Simmerly flowers. The two give you almost the exact same puzzled look. They make for easy healing potions. Oh. I can find some ropey around this area as well. You circle your finger around the river east of the main city. You sure are useful. That's amazing. You feel yourself getting a little embarrassed by the praise. It's just some stuff that I learned while studying medicine and the such. Hey guys! You all turn around to see the bear approaching your location. There he is. Oh, hey there, you guy. The moment he sees you, he adjusts his posture a bit, looking slightly taller now. We taking you on a quest today, eh? He already picked one. Huh? Sigmund takes a pocket knife from his belt and stabs the paper that you were pointing at earlier. We're clearing some dangerous looking plants. Oh. And gathering flowers. Oh. By the way, uh, we should get going. Don Simmerleaf's bloom at sunrise, but the petals wither super fast. You heard the expert. Let's hit the road.
You kneel down and reach for the small flower with the orange tinted petals. These were about to die. You stuff the petals into a glass vial and then push the cork in. Whoa. You hear the bear approaching. Where did you learn that stuff? Herbalism? Mostly from books. That's pretty cool, man. Keep up the pace. Sigmund's voice comes from a few meters away. The canine and the rodent walk ahead, the two of you, their interest on the plant collecting having faded soon after the first few ones. The bear, meanwhile, continues to follow you around and watch as you do the harvesting. No worries. Oberon shouts ahead before joining you back on the path. So, what are you going to do with them? I'm going to use these petals to make dawn potions. They help your body heal faster. Like the ones from Cain's? The shop in front of that big bakery? That's the one. I never bought anything from there, but this kind of potion is very common. Ah, I once bought a bottle from him. The bear shakes his head. I couldn't down the whole thing. And I down a lot of things. Hmm, I believe you. You notice him looking all around, surveying the land, like looking for something. I don't see any more of those orange ones. They're probably all gone by now. Aww. It's fine, though. From here, I'm going to start looking for a bro pie. What's that? Little herb that I use to make curatives. He scratches his chin. So, like, you can make a lot of different stuff, huh? Yeah, there's all kinds of different potions and medicinal mixtures, but they use other types of plants and herbs. You search your bag and take out a vial with yellow liquid inside. Like this one. It's a Somerset tonic. They say that it can boost your strength and make you fight like a beast. Mmm. Is it tasty, though? I never tried it, actually. I made it using Lion's Cane, a flower from Amalga, I think. You've been to Amalga? Oh, no, 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 no. I got it from a traveling merchant, and let me tell you, it was not cheap. Oof. <laughs> you two continue to walk down the narrow path. The bear seems to have run out of things to talk about, so you two share a comfortable silence with the rest of the way. You wonder if you should say something to spark more conversation, but you can't think of anything worth mentioning. A few minutes later, Sigmund can be seen taking a small map out of his pocket. He pauses just long enough for you and Oberon to catch up. Should be around here somewhere. Should we take a break? You better keep your guard up. Hewer. Sigmund interrupts himself. I, I mean, Apollo. He sounds like he just offended you. A little does he know that you could make a list of all the wrong names people have given you so far. Do you know some sort of spell to, like, find the spring? It takes you a second to process what he's asking of you. I don't think that's a thing. Huh. So we start looking around now. The usual. Let's just follow the river. It can't be far away. Well... He puts a hand on your shoulder. How about you two go on ahead and I'll help this fellow pick some herbs? Oh. Right now? Bear, I think it's better that we deal with the spring first. Yeah, the monster could be anywhere. We'll be right behind you. Sigmund appears apprehensive while Wes just shrugs. Mm, guess it's up to him then. All eyes fall on you. I think that we should stay close, but... She's right. He takes a step towards you and puts on a gentle smile. What do you think? We just gonna grab some stuff and then catch up with you guys. You feel yourself put on the spot. Not the most pleasant situation. You did mention that you wanted to grab some herbs and you could do that while there are no signs of danger nearby. But dealing with the spring first would also be a smart move. I don't know, if we're going to be doing a dungeon, I think it might be better to have extra healing potions, considering what happened, you know, in in the past. You know? But it would be nice to, you know, spend some time with Sigmund, I guess. Eh. 
German Shepherd. Black Bear. German Shepherd. Black Bear. Hmm. I know all of you want me to go with Sigmund. But I'm going to go with Oberon. You guys can scatter on ahead. I'll take the herb gathering out of the way. Oberon opens a big smile. Yeah. Then we can snatch those clusters and make our way home. I like the sound of that. Mm. Okay then. Sigmund looks at the bear and then back at you. For a moment you can rate that his worries about your safety are laid bare since you got a large bodyguard with you. We'll call you if we find anything. Gotcha. Leg it. The two turn around and continue to follow the path ahead. Oberon comes to your side and wraps an arm around you, pushing your body into his. Way to go. <laughs> he lets you go and starts walking towards the river. So, any herbs around here? You start surveying the land, trying to find one specific shape amongst the grass. Bropies grow on humid environments. There should be some sprawling all across this riverbank. Don't let me get in your way, then. You look up to see Oberon sitting on a rock near the water. He takes off the chainmail that he was wearing. Uh... Oh, sorry. I hope that I, you don't mind. Ah. Uh... He scratches the back of his head, embarrassed. Just gonna wash off a little. You stand in place for several seconds, watching the man take out more pieces of clothing. So, that was an excuse for you to slack off? The bear freezes for a split second. I, er. <laughs> he gives you a guilty look. Apparently you were spot on. Sorry about that. You sigh and start considering your options. This isn't anything that you haven't seen from others before. Your adventures set you up with all sorts of people. Lazy ones included. You know that the best course of action is to just not get bothered by it. You can join me if you want. You take a moment watching the near naked bear presenting his body proudly. I, uh... I'm fine. I'll just go ahead and gather. There it is, that familiar little herb. You find some bropite near the tree roots and start plucking it from the ground. You can hear Oberon in the water, letting out a relieved sighs. Ah, been a while since I had a proper bath. <laughs> a few minutes go by with you gathering herbs here and there, in peace, while your supposed bodyguard plays on the water. Without noticing, you end up creating some distance from him as you wander around plucking the tiny little plants until you spot one large leaf sticking out from the earth. The shape unfamiliar to you. Huh. You grab it and try to pull it out, but it shows incredible resistance, like it's fully stuck to the ground. You realize a little bit too late, that's a very bad sign. A vine-like root emerges from the ground and latches onto your wrist, pulling you under. Ah! ah! You try to pull yourself back and then see other roots emerging around that one. Bear guy! Help! You yank yourself free and fall back on your butt. Taking a wider look now, the roots keep growing from the ground, becoming taller and taller. You try to push yourself back to make some distance, but the menacing entities seem to follow on your movements, bending your direction. Mm. The bear, soaking wet, comes rushing in and delivers a chop to the root with his axe in hand. The disconnected piece of plant falls to the floor and dries up over a few seconds, dying out. You good? Yeah. You get up and stand behind Oberon as a few more roots appear. The hell are those? I think that's our quest target. Suddenly the ground around the roots starts crumbling and some ugly creatures emerge, the roots attached to them. That's why we couldn't find them. They were hiding. A few more appear, and now you lost count of how many stand before you. The bear shakes his weight around to try to dry his fursome, dousing you in the process. That's a whole lot, but... 
Oberon inhales and then exhales loudly, preparing himself before he charges in, running forward and swinging his axe around, chopping the creature's roots with ease. The monsters are rather slow and can't do much against the bear's attacks. He strikes down one after the other, decreasing their numbers fast. They don't seem very dangerous. And then right on cue, when a creature around him moves its roots like a whip and strikes the distracted man on the arm, making him drop one of his axes. Ugh. Oberon? I'm fine. That's nothing. He takes his axe from the ground and hurls it in the monster's direction. It goes spinning through the air until it lands on the creature's front. The thing goes limp. The roots fall to the floor and it dries out. The bear takes no time diving back in to finish the remaining monsters. Hmm. Finally, no other plant seems to be moving. You wouldn't expect such a mundane fact to give you such comfort. Oberon retrieves his previously thrown axe and stands in place, breathing heavily. Ugh. Okay. So that's done with. Now that you have some time to think and analyze your surroundings, you realize that there's something missing. Uh, I, I don't see a spring anywhere. You start walking over to the bear. But then you feel the ground tremble under you. One glance at Oberon and you can tell that he felt it too. What? And then it feels like the ground is growing beneath your feet. Something is making the earth rise up and it pushes you off balance, knocking you away. Ah! And then you manage to look up. Another creature, similar but bigger than the others, has surfaced out from the ground. One of its roots is wrapped tightly around Oberon's ankle, holding him upside down above the ground. What is this? This monster has more roots as limbs than the smaller ones, and they are quick to start swinging at the bear, which just holds his arms up, guarding his front. Her! Her! You watch for only a few seconds before determining that the bear is utterly helpless to save himself from the situation. You'll need to do something. Analyzing the monster's movements, an idea sparkles in your head. You kneel down and put your palms on the ground. The arcane circle on your glove does its thing. Before long, a circle is drawn somewhere close to the creature. A new root comes rushing up from the ground and it blocks one of the whip attacks. Two can play at this game. You try and maneuver the roots to keep it blocking the attacks, but the monster has way too many tentacles at its disposal and the enemy has much better control of them than you do. You start questioning if you're being useful at all. But then you hear a whistle. An arrow comes flying from far behind the monster and hits the root holding the bear up, snapping it. Oberon falls to the floor with a loud thud. Next, Sigmund comes rushing with his blade in hand. Ha! He jumps in the air and swings his weapon, cutting one of the monster's roots. He becomes a blur of motions going from side to side, the arches of his sword passing through the creature's tendrils and cutting them with expert precision. While the canine has the enemy's attention, you decide to get up and make a run to try and get to Oberon, who's standing on the floor, barely moving. The moment that your palm lifts from the ground, your magic circle fades away and the roots that you controlled quickly become motionless. This guy's got a tough bottom. Sigmund resumes his battle stance and studies the monster for a second. He then takes a few steps back and dashes forward into a lunge, dodging all the roots that try to get in his way. Using his claws, he manages to climb on top of the monster. The thing begins to shake around trying to throw the dog away, but Sigmund holds tight to one of the leaves. While keeping balance, Sigmund pulls back his blade, pointing it down, taking careful aim until... The blade pierces it. The monster ceases all movement. All of the roots that moved about are quick to fall numb and wither away within seconds. The plant monster too starts to shrink and perish away. Hmm. Sigmund pulls his sword up and sweeps it in the air to clean out some of the nasty fluids covering it. After being amazed by the fantastic finishing act, your attention shifts back to the bear in front of you. He heaves himself up to a sitting position and, at first glance, it doesn't seem like he sustained much damage at all. You... you good? 
Yeah, I'm good. You offer him an arm to help him get up, which takes him by surprise. He looks at you and then smiles before accepting the help. You nearly fall over from the weight, having to use all of your strength and lean your body back to keep yourself from losing balance. Hmm. The bear chuckles and then pats his body down, cleaning some of the dust and dirt covering his fur. Looks like that was our target. Sigmund kicks the defeated corpse to the side. And that's our spring. Exactly where the monster was standing during the fight. So that big thing was standing on top of it this whole time? It's a crack on the ground where a subtle purple smoke escapes into the air. Around the crack, the earth has crystallized into a dirty blue ore. So, did the monster rip all of your clothes, or were you guys in the middle of something? She has a smirk on her face, looking at you and Oberon standing side by side. Um. Hmm. <laughs> you feel yourself getting embarrassed while the bear just scratches his head and laughs nervously. Well, what matters is that we survived. The dog sheathes his sword. And it didn't. You turn your attention back to the bear. Are you okay, though? You got hit a lot. I told you, I'm good. He opens his arms and turns him around, showing you a couple of grazes and streaks where his fur is missing. Surprisingly, it does seem like all the damage he took was merely superficial. Bear has a layer of natural armor, you know. She means my muscles. He inhales, sucking in his gut and making his form look incredibly muscular. Yeah, let's go with that. You still think that those whips together with the fall must have been somewhat painful. You wonder if he should spare a little mana to heal the bear anyways. Sure. You take a step closer and stop in front of him. He looks at you, mild confusion on his face. You take a deep breath and reach your hand into his chest, feeling the damp fur. Oh. Oh. The circle on your glove starts glowing and you start focusing on helping his body heal. Ah. Oberon lets out a sigh and his body relaxes. After a couple of seconds, your glove stops glowing and you can tell that his body must feel much better now. You can also feel that his chest gives off more warmth than it did before. Uh, you then pull your hand back in a hurry. Whoa. Did you heal me? Yeah, uh, just a little. Oberon puts his hand on his chest where your hands were a second ago. It feels... That felt like... Good. Mm, well, yeah, you should feel less pain now. I... By now you can discern the subtle embarrassment on his voice. Um... Thanks, man. It's no problem. Is that how you perform healing magic? Then the dog switches to a very low tone. I think I hurt my hips in the fight. Shut up. West hits Sigmund's arm with her elbow, making him chuckle. So... I assume that you can help us with the ceiling part? She gestures at the spring on the floor. Yeah. You walk up to the small crack and put your hands down. The glove glows. A circle appears around the opening on the ground, and the earth starts to move, closing itself around the crack. A few seconds later, the spring is sealed and no more smoke escapes. And done. Nice. Bear, where's the bag? Oh. Oberon turns around and starts running towards where he left his things. Sigmund shakes his head, smiling. He then walks up to the spring and kneels by it. Not a lot, but it's something. Did you get your herbs, by the way? Oh, yeah, I did. Hmm, nice. Sigmund begins plucking some of the ore from the ground. Here. The bear comes back and throws a burlap sack to the canine, who uses it to store the blue ores. Gotta say... Your ceiling job was much better than mine. You can't compare a scroll to the real deal. Obviously. Oh, and those roots back there. He points with his thumb to the spot that he was hanging from earlier. It was you, wasn't it? Ah, uh, yeah. I got a little creative. 
You can sense the curiosity coming from everyone around you. You ever heard of green magic? We use it to stimulate plant growth. I've heard of something like that before. I saw the monster using the roots to attack and figured that I could do something similar. It was worth a shot. Man, that's like, so cool. He approaches you and rests his hand on your shoulder, giving you a comforting smile. I guess he passed the trial, yeah? Sigmund gets up with his little bag of clusters. Hell yes. For sure. Hmm, thank you guys. Alright, let's head back and sell the goodies. Wait, I need to wash off again. Oh, Oberon. Quest complete. Sigmund rips the paper out of the board and retrieves his knife. And herbs gathered. Are we getting free potions? Oberon shakes you by the shoulder. Hm, sure. I gotta go pay Max a visit. Hey, you gotta celebrate with us first. Let's go get some mugs. Wait, now? It's a bit of a tradition. We always get something to drink after a successful mission. It's great for morale. Mm, well, okay. The group enters the tavern, lively and loud as ever. Apollo and Mundo! You all small Caden, waving her arms in the air. Hmm, always so subtle. You all walk up to the bar and the two share a strong handshake. Almost looks like they try to arm wrestle for a second. Did you clear out that dungeon? Not yet, but working my way to it. The two laugh it out. Wes walks away to find a table and Oberon sits on a stool. We just cleared a small camp near the North Bridge. Ah, some nice old bonding, hmm? Yeah, we had to test trial our new companion. You kidding? He's the goat. Well, Tiger. She bursts out laughing. You lower your head between your shoulders in embarrassment. Hmm, he sure is, huh? He did great, and we're gonna get some sweet potions too. Atta boy. She gives you a rough pat on the head. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of, let me tell you something. She leans in closer to you and you raise your hand to look at her. Certain Arbiter passed by earlier looking for you. It takes you but a second to process. When you realize what she means, your eyes go wide. What? When? Not too long ago. Oh. You turn back and make a run for the door. What? There he goes. Sigmund and Oberon watch you leave in utter confusion. Caden has her arms crossed, chuckling. You run the streets of the outskirts, reaching for the arc that leads into the Green Wall, the wealthier part of the city. The population, consisting mostly of adventurers and labor workers, changed to mostly merchants and the rich couples going out for strolls. It doesn't take you long before you reach your house. You are quick to open the door, letting the sunlight illuminate the place. You walk inside and your eyes adjust to the different lighting. You don't see anyone in the living room. But footsteps can be heard coming down the stairs. Then he appears, holding a book in his hands. Welcome home. You run and jump into a hug. Pluto! He holds ground from the tackle, hugging you back. You two share a warm embrace. You miss me that bad, huh? Yes! You hug him tighter. You can feel his hand passing through your hair. He combs it with his fingers. I really missed you too, Apollo. Several seconds go by with you two just holding each other. You are the one to finally hint at pulling away. I'm sorry. Did you wait too long? I was out on a quest. Don't worry about it, but I can't stay much longer. He lets you go and walks to the door, putting the book on the table nearby. Work? As always. You expected such words, but they managed to knock down your mood regardless. Hey, don't be like that. He walks up to you and places both hands on your shoulders. Come, I gotta visit some shops while I'm in town. His hand slides down to your arm and takes you by the hand. I want you to make me company. You brighten up a bit more. Well, 
Okay. How about I get you something nice? And we can have dinner too, maybe. Dinner sounds good. Hmm, great. Let's get going. Pluto holds you by the hand while you two walk the streets of the Green Walk back to the outskirts, going towards the big street, replete with shops on both sides as well as all sorts of stalls, just about everywhere. Did you start reading the Larry Otter book? I found it by your bed. What? Oh, uh, I already read it all. Oh yeah? I don't get the appeal of Jay Crowling's writing. It's full of terrible biases. Pluto chuckles. I remember when you liked those kind of fairy tales. Really? I read you a few books back then. You don't remember? I remember you reading to me. I didn't know a lot of the words. You feel your ears lowering down. And look at you now being all critical of a fantasy book. He chuckles again. I just got a lot of free time now. Oh yeah? Maybe I should get you a couple of new books then. Better material for sure. I love that horror romance that you got me last summer. Archways? Yeah. Hmm. Guess that'll help me pick a good one for you later. Pluto slows down his pace, and you notice him walking towards a big armored knight in the aspect of a wolf standing in front of a shop. You recognize him as being Pluto's companion, to always walk together whenever Pluto has to do work-related stuff. When the white tiger gets close, the knight hands him a paper. Pluto takes it and starts reading it. You try to discreetly look to the knight's face behind the helmet. You can't tell if he can see you until his head jerks your direction. Good evening. He does a quick nod, but you feel like you've been caught staring. A good evening. And then you stare at the floor. Pluto gives you a quick glance. Oh yeah, uh, Gunner will be joining us for a bit. Hope you don't mind. It's a pleasure to properly meet you, Apollo. His voice is so deep and he sounds so serious. You feel like he's saying it out of complete obligation. Uh, same here. And then you try to avoid his gaze, looking at the floor or whatever passes by you. Nothing else to do here. Let's move. Pluto starts walking again. You and Gunnar accompany him, each one on of his sides. Did you plan to visit any other? Yeah, Lawrence's. And maybe get some dinner too. Hmm. Do you want to eat here or would you rather go to the walk? You realize that he's talking to you. Um, I don't know. Either or. or. Hmm, okay then. You choose not to say anything. The knight's presence acting as an inhibitor for you. You feel a quiet, judgmental aura coming from him that you cannot explain. Don't mind him, he doesn't bite. Pluto is looking at you with a smile. Even after that reassurance, you continue to stay quiet for the next half a minute or so until you three arrive at a shop with a fancy front. Golden gifts. This won't take a minute, Gunner. Mm hmm? Take care of my little brother for me. Of course. Pluto gives you a pat on the arm and then knocks on the door before entering. You are left with the imposing knight, both standing side by side in front of the shop. You take another peek at the helmet, this time drawing your gaze away before he notices. His posture is impeccable, and he is built like a mountain, or at least you assume so, given the size and shape of his armor. You feel the need to break the silence somehow, but you're afraid that he's the kind of person who doesn't uh, appreciate small talk. Hee 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 hee. Uh, so, um... His head does a slow turn to face you. It takes you by surprise, somehow. You and Pluto work together, yeah? It takes him a second to reply. Yes. Not much to work with. You guys are always traveling together, right? Yes. Great progress. You try and think of something else to say. These obvious questions aren't leading anywhere. 
Um. He clears his throat, drawing your attention. Your brother and I have been assigned partners by the house. Now that's something that you can work with. Uh, assigned partners? Yes. Well, you blew it. You look down at the ground and draw a little circles on the dirt with your claw. Apollo. Hmm? You and your brother... He makes a long, awkward pause. You... You two look alike. You stare at him, occasionally blinking. That's all. You shift your gaze to absolutely nothing in front of you. That was a very weird thing to say, right? Wait, was that his attempt at small talk? You turn your gaze back to him and he immediately turns his head away. He's embarrassed. Apparently you both suck at this. You can't help but let some giggling's escape. Hmm? Ah, uh, sorry. It's nothing. Hmm. You start wondering how in the world can Pluto communicate with him. Well, at least it looks like you made some progress just now. The white tiger comes out of the shop holding a small bag. He sighs and continues walking forward. You and Gunner proceed to follow on his footsteps. <sighs> well... That wasn't as annoying as I thought it would be. Hmm. Alright, now dinner time. Pluto. They both face each other. Pluto's expression slowly transforms into a displeased stare. We should return to the house, sooner rather than later. The white tiger scoffs, but the knight doesn't flinch. Yeah, right. Apollo, he turns to face you and puts a hand on your shoulder. We'll have to get dinner another day, alright? He pulls you in for a hug. You lay your head on his shoulder and wrap your arm around his midsection. You have to go already? Sorry, kitten. I'll make it up to you, okay? Hmm. I'll get you lots of books and a dinner on that fancy place that you like, yeah? When? Well, he sighs. Soon. Okay. Hey, don't be like that. He pets your head gently, running his fingers through your hair. I was actually thinking, if you could buy me a book from Max. Hmm? What book? It's one about green magic. I've been trying to learn more about it. That's great. Here. He digs into a pouch on his side and takes out a handful of golden coins. Buy the book and whatever else you want. You two separate from the hug. He takes your hand and deposits the coins. But... You lift your head so that you can look him in the eyes now. I could teach you something myself, yeah? Really? Yeah, I'll show you a new trick or two. What do you think? Sounds great. Awesome. You two stare into each other's eyes, beaming with happiness. Alright, alright. Me and Mr. Grumpo got some places to be now. Okay. We're staying at the Lofts, that hotel near the park, yeah? I know it. Come by tomorrow and we can have a little magic lesson, okay? Okay. Love you, Apollo. He pats your head gently. I love you too, Pluto. I'll see you later. He turns and walks away. Gunner gives you a brief nod before turning around and following Pluto. You sigh. You open your hand to see the golden coins. That's a good sum of money. It would take you several camps clearing quests to reach that amount. Or maybe one or two dungeons. You close your hand and start walking down the street towards magic finds.
and I met with my brother today. Oh, yeah? Maxwell is sitting on a chair by the front counter while you stand in front of the desk near the back of the room. You open a cabinet displaying several glass flasks with substances of all colors. Uh, but he was busy, as he always is. We barely had time to talk. You're letting your frustration escape bit by bit. He is an arbiter. Yeah, yeah. You take a vial from your bag, the one containing the dawn, simmer leaves that you gathered earlier today. I didn't know that he would be back in town or else I would have saved the day to hang out, you know. A lot of arbiters are going to be returning to town around this time. You pretty much ignore what he said and continue venting. Ever since he became an arbiter, our lives got a lot better, but... At what cost? You put the orange petals in the glass cup, standing inside a circle drawn on the desk. You put a finger on the circle and it lights up. A few seconds after, the water on the cup starts boiling. Hmm... I just need to pass the Arbiter test, and then we'll be able to work together. I'll be his new work partner or whatever. You take a flask with a brownish oil, sniff it for a second, and then pour some into the boiling mix. I gotta meet him today, his partner. Kind of a scary guy. The High Knight? Yeah, you know him? I've seen him around, walking with Pluto. You now take two small boxes from the shelf nearby, opening them when it contains a gray, mushy paste, the other sugar. He's actually one of the oldest arbiters around, quite the achievement. You watch the petals inside the cup lose their colors as the boiling water slowly turns orange. And... Um... Speaking of... Partners... Maxwell almost whispers that last word. How's your, um, new party going? You add a spoonful of the paste and a pinch of sugar to the mix and start stirring. The liquid starts turning bright red. Oh, they're fine. We cleared a camp today. There were these creepy plants using roots as whips. Wicked crazy wicked. Oh goodness. The bear got caught and this big monster was whacking him left and right. Maxwell shivers in his seat. That sounds so dangerous. It was all good, really. Easy stuff, all things considered. You take the mix and pass it through a sifter into a few glass vials. The resulting liquid is a transparent, glossy red concoction. You plug all the vials with their corks. And they got these Dawn potions out of it. Big success. Impressive. You put the potions in your bag and bring it over your shoulder. By the way, did you save me that book? Of course. You take a few gold coins from the pocket and put it on the counter. Did you get all these from the camp? These? Oh no. Pluto gave me that. Ah. Uh, we got a little today. You slap your forehead. Man, I even forgot to take my share. I left in such a hurry. I see. I'll probably find them at the tavern tomorrow. Maxwell takes the book from the shelf behind the counter and hands it to you. Thanks, Max. You're the best. The hyena practically blushes, trying to look away. You put the book on your bag, carefully arranging space inside it. Apollo... Mm hmm? The hyena is fidgeting with his fingers. He looks incredibly nervous. Would you like to... Um... His head lowers even more. Would you like to... He's poking the tips of his fingers together. You have a good idea of what he might be getting into. Work for me? Huh? Certainly not the question that you were expecting. What do you mean? Like... He deflates a little, then takes a big breath in. You're always going on these... Dangerous quests. He looks at you with bleeding eyes. I always fear that... And then he looks away. 
You don't need to. You could. You would make a lot of money as an alchemist. Max. Work for me and you'll never be in danger. Please. You put a solemn hand on his shoulder. It prompts him to look up at you. You kind of already have goals. But you... Mm. I would be considerate in real life. But at the same time, I would have to be real with him. Because apparently his goal, Apollo's goal, is to become a professional healer for the Arbiters. Which I guess would be kind of like appointed knight people. Basically like the police, I guess. Um, because he want he wants to be with his older brother, but I'm pretty sure that's not gonna happen. Like even if you go, even if he becomes an arbiter, that is that's no guarantee that he's gonna be placed with his brother. Mm, be considerate or be real. I guess I could be considerate. I appreciate it, Max, really. And I'm thankful for everything that you do for me. But... His eyes slowly lower down to the floor. I want to become a healer. I want to become an arbiter. And I can't do that sitting behind a desk, mixing potions. I... I understand. He sinks down into a gloom. You give him a second to think. To process his emotions. Hey. He raises his eyes without lifting his head. Even when I become an arbiter, I will never stop coming here, you know? You're my friend, Max. Yeah. Friend. He regains some of his composure and adjusts his glasses. And hey. If this healer business fails to make me coin, we can always strike a deal, yeah. You get your face real close to his, immediately gaining his full attention. The old-fashioned way, hmm? You wink, and his face goes completely red. Yeah. I mean, yes, of course. And there he is. Finally back to himself. You slap the counter and make your way around it, heading for the entrance. Alright, I'm heading back home to have some fun with this thick guy. What? You shake your back to signal the book inside. Maxwell takes one second before turning bright red. You laugh and open the door, stopping for just a second before leaving. Geez, Sigma's be getting to me. You close the door behind you. You arrive home, the fatigue of a full day starts to weigh down on you. You put your bag on the table and walk into the washing room. Despite being a very nice house, you spend barely any time in here. Most of your days are spent either at the tavern, at Max's shop, or outside the city, going on all sorts of quests and errands. Your home is merely the place that you return to clean up and rest. You fill a tub with hot water and lay down to have a long, relaxing soak. Ah. Really needed that. You close your eyes and sigh in relief. Your mind begins to wander. Really? Hmm, who am I thinking about in the bath? Sigmund, Oberon, Gunner, Maxwell? The shepherd dog, so outgoing and charismatic, and a huge tease as well. He keeps flirting with you, 
and you can tell a lot of it is for fun and games, but sometimes it feels like it really isn't. He's probably aware of how he can get to you, and isn't shy of using that to tease you even more. But aside from his demeanor, he also happens to be a great fighter. You saw firsthand what he can do with a sword. But now, it has you thinking. How well can he use his other sword? Oh, what a tease. Who is he thinking of now? You're reminded of the bear, Oberon, taking off his armor before going into the river. You didn't say anything back then, but the sight was quite mesmerizing. A man his size never fails to draw your attention, especially one with his build. He also seems very interested in your abilities and your knowledge about herbalism. It feels nice to have someone appreciate what you can do. A welcome change of pace from the usual goon that just assumes your healing magic can do miracles and expects you to know everything. Oberon, on the other hand, is a complete package. And what a package. Ah, Oberon. So big. What about Gunner? Are you into older men, Apollo? Pluto's partner, the High Knight. You know very little about him, except for the fact that he must be incredibly strong. Arbiters are naturally powerful, but most of them don't live as long as Gunner has lived, becoming ever more experienced. You don't know how Pluto managed to connect with him in the first place, but after trying to talk to him today, it seems like he has a warm heart under all that plate armor. He is definitely someone that you would want to keep around, maybe for more reasons than one. Hmm, and he looks so good in that armor. I'm gonna humor Maxwell. Max has been one of your only friends since you came to Arborea. He's been so kind and understanding of your situation back then, but also very welcome to your alternative payment methods, a bad habit from a different time. But that was before Pluto's job made your life so much easier. Nowadays, you're just glad to have someone who you can talk to freely as well as an alchemy table and supplies to help you improve your craft. And considering Max's feelings towards you, maybe working for him wouldn't be such a bad deal after all? Certainly a comfy option. Finish. In the bath. Oh god. You feel the weightlessness of your fur drifting in the warm water the relaxing heat on your skin, on your sore muscles. Nothing better after a day of hard work. Ah. You lay your head back, your hands slipping into the water. Oh, Apollo. Hmm. The images of the man crowding your head, pictured in the most obscene ways. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, it keeps you going. Until... I'm not saying that. <laughs> You flop into your bed, exhausted. Uh, can't wait until tomorrow. You gaze into the ceiling of your room for a while, but then shift into gazing out the window into the starry skies. Questing with my new party, hanging out with Pluto and Gunner, working for Max at the shop. You curl up on the bed and shut your eyes. The repose finds you with ease. I wonder what I'll do next. To be continued. Well, it wouldn't be a furry visual novel without some little 
shenanigans happening. Uh, so, who do you think Apollo should... Actually, no, let me rephrase the question. What do you think Apollo should do? Do you think he should take the safe option and work for Max, the hyena? It seems like it would be easy enough to do, you know. It would be a steady job, job security. You would be working to help people. You already know more or less what the job entails. You're, you're pretty knowledgeable already, but you would be able to gain more knowledge as new books come in and stuff like that. You wouldn't have to buy them. You would be able to rate them right there. But he wouldn't be able to go and be an arbiter with his brother. So he would be at work and his brother would maybe not be able to visit him enough, you know. If he went and became like a full-time healer for Sigmund's group. Like, he would probably make some coin. He would be among people that he apparently can get along with, you know. Um, the bear and the German shepherd and, like, even the rat girl. But is that really what he wants? Or is that just a stepping stone to being able to become a full-time or actual professional healer? I guess it's just the proper, proper word. Um, so that he can become a, an arbiter healer to hopefully, at least in his mind, work with his brother and be able to be with his brother full time. But is that really what he wants? Because, you know, there's a whole thing of, you know, should he get what he wants or should he get what he needs? Does he really want to be with his brother all the time? Or does he need just to get out and do stuff, something? Obviously, what we saw in the uh, prologue is still valid. With the exception of the prologue that you guys saw is a little bit different from the one that is, um, that's here, I believe. Because I don't remember in the prologue that I read that um, the characters, I think that only one of them survives or is seen fighting still. But in this version of the, that I sort of skimmed through in order to try to remember what was happening. Um, I saw, again, Jim dies. Jim was a fox. I think he was like, um, like a, the, like the rogue type character. And the lion and the wolf. Uh, I think there's still the option to save Jim or give him the, the healing antidote and then go and heal the lion which is like the main, the, the tank of the group. Um, and that's the option that I took again this time. And I think that you also had the option of healing the wolf or healing the lion. But this time around, the fight um, goes way differently. And you leave Jim to his untimely fate. And you go and you see that the lion and the wolf are fighting their butts off. So Apollo tries to use the healing magic again, but he's very low on healing magic and it works, but he's, you know, he's already running low, but it's the two characters that are fighting instead of just being either or either the wolf or the lion. It's both the wolf and the lion fighting. So, but it ends right there. It doesn't actually tell you again, oh, they actually made it or they didn't make it. And Apollo was the only survivor. I'm pretty sure that we'll eventually find out later. And it would be interesting if, like, they end up running into each other again. Or Apollo runs into, um, the lion and the wolf again. And, you know, we get to see what happened. Like, they survived or they didn't or something. I don't know. Or they end up running into the, I think it was a centipede monster. They end up having to fight the centipede monster again. By which I mean, um, Apollo and, you know, both with this new team of Sigmund and Oberon and West. Yeah, that's her name. Lady West. Anyway, so also the options when you're when Sigmund is flirting with you at the beginning where he is trying to pay for your drink, you can say like, no, no, I have money. I can pay for my own drink. 
And Sigmund is sort of like, oh, oh, okay. Like he didn't expect you to not reciprocate. And then the second time around, where you can choose to like play along with this like um with him calling you like uh what did he call you something well he basically called you like a super good healer you could be like well i, I don't know I, I don't deal with titles and then again it like catches him off guard and he's like oh uh, uh okay um but the other two find it funny weston Oberon, like it's like haha look dude you're your flirty little personality isn't working on this dude. But yeah. I did not see what happens if you decide to go with Sigmund. So if you guys want to find out what happens if you decide to instead go with Sigmund instead of going with Oberon, then, you know, you can play this yourself or find somebody that's already playing it, you know, whatever. You know, I won't mind if you watch some other person's videos. I don't care. You could do whatever you want. It's your life. Anyways, but yeah, so, you know, write down what you, you know, what you thought of this uh, update. The first chapter, actually. And thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play I Need Healing, you can do so by going down into the link in the description, which should have a direct link for the I Need Healing. Uh, and actually, no, it's um, the creator's Twitter page, which is here. I believe that's their name. And they should have a direct link to the itch.io page where you can download it. Or you can just go to itch.io yourself and download it from there. And I don't recall if they have any form of support yet. If they do, I will link that down in the description. If not, then, you know, oh well. Uh, you can leave a good comment, a good, re a good review on their page, you know, and say like, Hey, your vision novel is really cool. Keep it up. And, you know, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Anyways, but yeah. All the pertinent links will be linked down in the description, and I guess that's it for now, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Bye-bye.